Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Dr. Paul Saladino has been beating the drum on the nose-to-tail evidence and ancestral-based carnivore movement, and is a classically trained MD as well as a functional medicine practitioner. If you don't know Paul by now, definitely check him out. He's been on the podcast before. He's the first return guest, and that's for a good reason. He's Dr. Radical, and he has his own <laughs> podcast, and I'm super excited to have you on, Paul. Thanks, man. I didn't, that's a good one. I never thought about Dr. Radical. <laughs> I'm a child of the 80s. Did you ever see that movie in the 80s, Rad? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I'm you sure you have, that. though. You need to use that. that was like my favorite movie. You need to watch that movie, Scott. It's about BMX biking, and it is amazing. That okay. was like the anthem of my childhood was the movie Rad. But yeah, man, thanks for having me back on. It's good to be back. I didn't awesome. know I was the first return guest. Rock yeah, you are. Um, absolutely happy to have you. Um, why don't you, it'd be great to just start by telling folks, you know, some of the latest stuff you've launched and, and stuff you have going on. I know you're in the middle of a move. Um, but yeah, I, I'll definitely link to everything in the show notes, but for anyone who doesn't know what's, what's new in the world of Paul Saladino. So I am finishing my residency at the university of Washington. It's been a long process, but it's done. I'm finishing it in the next week. I'm moving to San Diego, where I'm going to be um, launching the Carnivore Army, which is going to consist <laughs> of my private practice in functional medicine based in San Diego. And I'm going to be surfing a lot there. And I'm going to be doing my own podcast, which is Fundamental Health with Paul Saladino, MD. And then I've got my newsletter going. People can sign up for the Fundamental Health newsletter on my website, which is paulsaladinomd.com. And I'm currently revamping the website. It's all going to be directed to Carnivore MD pretty soon. So people can look for that. It's not up yet. Still go to Paul Saladino MD, but I'm just, I'm super excited to be growing. And, um, be, you know what the coolest thing is, man, is that a lot of people are starting to notice the carnivore movement and they're, they're, they're kind of approaching it with an open mind from even the mainstream science perspective. And I think that's really cool. I, I went on a podcast with Dr. Stephen Gundry, who wrote The Plant Paradox, and uh, that's going to be out at some point this summer, so people can look for that. And I didn't know it was going to be like that, but he said, yeah, this is going to be a friendly debate. And I was like, all right, bring it on. Let's do it. So, yeah, he like wanted to challenge me with a bunch of stuff, and I think that it really went well, and um, it was a good forum to just really address many of the concerns that people in mainstream circles have about the carnivore diet. I did a podcast with Joseph Mercola that's going to be out this summer. And I think that's going to reach a lot of people. I did a podcast with the minimalists in Los Angeles. And, um, in, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be on Dave Asprey's bulletproof. So I'm stoked that folks like Dave and Stephen Gundry and Joe Mercola are open to the idea of a carnivore diet. And I think, and I mean, Ben Greenfield obviously is. I think pretty soon it's going to be like a lot of people, more and more people are going to be talking about it. So it's exciting times, man. Yeah, super cool. And I've always been impressed by your ability to cite the research, cite studies, openly debate, come at this from a really evidence-based approach. Um, and, you know, we've covered a lot of the topics um, and, and you have on your podcast as well, such as, you know, why, why it may be beneficial to include organ meats, um, why you don't need plants, how plants can be harmful, fiber, all that jazz. Um, but wanted to expand on some more in-depth topics today um, that I've seen you talk about a little bit or at least think about and would love to just get your, your closer opinions on them. Sure. Yeah, I think there's all kinds of fun stuff going on. And it's I love I think it's so cool. It's always evolving. Right. So it's fun to think about the new stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So one that doesn't get talked about enough, in my opinion, 
And this kind of builds off your whole message of, you know, what could stop the carnivore movement? What could bring it down? Um, or what are, what are risks to the carnivore movement? And that one of those, in my opinion, is salmonella and food poisoning. Um, and I think in general, there are misconceptions about what is safe to consume raw. And there are some foods that are probably really safe, but people are very afraid of. And there are other foods where I just see people being a little too, um, liberal with their consumption of raw, uh, raw meat and raw animal products. Um, and so just wanted to get kind of your opinion on some of these items, you know, there's, there's people eating raw liver, frozen raw liver, egg yolks, I know you're a big fan of. Um, but then there's even people going as far as saying, you know, I'm just going to eat everything raw, steak, ground beef, pork, chicken. Um, so, like, where is your biggest concern and how, how do you sort of think about, you know, safe consumption of some of these foods? Yeah, you know, I think this is a great topic. I'm glad you brought this up. I really appreciate it. And I always appreciate your insightful vision in the carnivore world. I think that you're such an asset to the community for this kind of perspective. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. So I think that the raw movement within the carnivore world is intriguing, but I just have to say that as a physician, I agree with you a little bit. I fear that if we are too cavalier about the consumption of raw animal foods, people will run into problems and that could be a detrimental thing for the carnivorous movement. I think that you know, mostly everything is going to retain the majority of its nutrients when we cook it. Um, this whole conversation is sort of couched or the contextualized in a bigger conversation about um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines, which I would love to get into a little bit. But I think that the safest way to consume a carnivore diet is everything cooked, whether it's an egg yolk, whether it's a whole egg, whether it's a steak, whether it's liver, Okay. And we can get into all the individual pieces of that and what people may experiment with individually. But any time that we eat anything that's not completely cooked, we're putting ourselves at risk. You know, people know that when they go to sushi, there's me- there's warnings on the menu. And admittedly, like, I don't like well-done steaks. And so I think we all are, you know, going to have to just decide where we make the personal decision about how much we want to cook our food and how much we want to enjoy the flavor or experiment with undercooked or slightly less cooked meat. I think that the party line around the meat would be that if the center of the meat is not at like 130, 140 degrees, you can't be sure that there's not going to be something in the meat. Now, having said that, a steak that is not ground up is pretty darn safe to eat pretty rare in my opinion. There's not many parasites or pathogens that are going to live in the muscle of a cow, you know? And the other thing is that most of the meat that we're getting is USDA inspected and people can see it. And if there's something in the meat, the inspectors are going to see these things. So this is an interesting thing that if you've ever seen, you know, an infection in the muscle of a cow, it's pretty obvious. It's like a really clear scar in the muscle of the cow. So it's not a subtle thing, but you know, I think that if people wanted to be completely safe, they would never eat anything raw and they would never eat anything probably rare or even mid rare. It would always be medium, you know, medium would be the, the way to cook it. But having said that, I've eaten a ton of steaks, rare, you know, I've eaten, you know, raw meat, multiple occasions. You go to this, went to a great steakhouse here in Seattle and they had, you know, like Wagyu, you know, Wagyu sashimi or carpaccio. And you're, of course you're going to eat that raw. And I think that those are fairly safe. So in terms of raw meat, you know, the outside of the meat, you don't know who's been handling it. But if you trust where it's been or you can somehow clean the outside of the meat, you know, I think that eating like sliced sashimi meat is fairly safe. Um, Again, a safer thing would be to sear the outside of the meat and decide where you're comfortable with the inside of the meat being. So that's that's just the steak equation from my uh, from my perspective. Ground beef is a whole different story. And the problem with ground beef is they're putting it through a grinder and that surface of that meat is the surface area of that meat is exponentially increased in terms of how it could be contaminated with things. And this is how we get E. coli, um, you know, 157, 0157 infections is that there's a, there's an E. coli somewhere in ground beef or something that gets passed in there. And it's, it's never, it's rarely in a steak. It's on the surface of ground beef. I mean, I'm not a fan of eating really raw ground beef. You're just, you're putting yourself at risk 
of just the contamination of that ground beef. And then you have to think about toxoplasmosis, you know, and there's probably a little more toxoplasmosis in raw meat and especially raw ground beef. Now, again, it's like, ah, who knows? Um, but I would not, I'm not a big fan of eating tons of ground beef unless you really know where it come, where it comes from. And that's just the party line, you know, like we just have to be careful and, you know, we're all sort of adventurers in this realm and people can decide what they're comfortable with. But, um, we need to be a little careful with that perspective in terms of eggs. Um, the infectious parts of eggs are on the shell. They're not in the egg. Uh, so eating raw yolks, I think is pretty darn safe because the yolk is, has this little membrane on it and there's nothing on the outside of an egg that's really going to touch the yolk. And if it does, you'll see it sort of, um, break the yolk and it's, it's really low incidence of a problem from the egg yolk. Now, if you're going to eat a raw white, which I wouldn't advise anyone to do because of avidin, that egg white is going to come in contact with the shell a little more and you may have an issue there. Now, the other issue, the other part of this is sometimes I recommend or frequently I recommend people think about a calcium source on a carnivorous diet. And, you know, this is kind of a nuanced conversation because the bone meal is a little tricky to source. You have to be aware of the lead content in the bone meal. And I think eggshells are a good source of calcium for humans. Now, the thing about eggshells is then you're eating the shell. And so anything that's on the shell, you're going to eat directly. That could definitely be a source of Campylobacter or Salmonella. So if people want to be very safe about eggshells, you can just boil them and then it'll kill anything on them. And it's not going to degrade the calcium carbonate that's in the eggshell. And then you can eat the eggshell safely. But I do think we need to worry about or at least be aware of places where people could get sick. Raw liver is definitely... Um, something that I'm intrigued by. And there's a whole hashtag, the raw liver gang. And I love all these yeah. people. I love it. And, you know, from the research that I've done, here's what the deal is with raw liver. I don't think anybody really knows how long you have to freeze liver to kill any parasites in the liver. And because of global warming and changes in the climate, there are an increased amount of liver flukes that are contaminating beef liver in the Pacific Northwest. Not so much in New Zealand and other countries, so it depends where your liver is coming from. But there is liver, there are liver flukes in liver um, in cows sourced from the Pacific Northwest. Now, if you look at that on a liver, you can usually see it. Almost all the time you can see it. You know, I've talked to butchers about this and they can, they, you know, I've eaten fresh raw lamb's liver when I was in Austin and I talked to the butcher at length and he said, you know, if there's a parasite or something, you can see streaking and scarring on the surface of the liver. And this kind of gets to the idea that, like, you probably should know your butcher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, should, we should get a little bit of an education about animal organs and, you know, and, and we should be connected to the food we're eating and either trust our butcher to make sure the livers look good if we're going to eat it thawed out when it's frozen or look at the liver ourselves. One of the things that I did recently was I bought a whole cow's liver. It was 10 pounds of liver. It's amazing. But I could see the whole liver. It was amazing. And you can see the whole thing was, like, smooth. And really pristine. There were no scars. There were no streaks. And I think in that case, the chances that there's anything in that liver are very low. And, you know, for myself, I felt comfortable freezing it for maybe a week or two and then eating it raw and thawed. Now, I'm not sure everybody would agree with that. And as a physician, I wouldn't dare advise that to anyone lest I get in trouble. But, you know, I think everybody has to make their own decisions about what they're comfortable with with liver. I think that obviously the, the, the safest way to eat liver is to cook it, just like meat. But, you know, I think that there are there's things about that raw liver is beneficial because it's maybe going to preserve some of the B vitamins. Some of the things in raw liver are a little bit heat labile. There are indigenous cultures that eat raw liver. But we do have to be aware of the way the liver looks. And I think that most of these things in the liver, whether it's um, Toxicara, which is a, a roundworm or a whipworm or a liver fluke, are going to cause scars and lesions on the liver. And you can pretty much tell where it is. But eating raw liver is not the safest thing to do. I'll admit it. Like nobody knows how long it takes to freeze the liver to kill things. And then, you know, I've had butchers say you have to freeze it at like negative 20 degrees for a certain amount of time. So if people want to be super safe, they should just eat cooked liver. Um, but personally, I prefer the raw and I've kind of taken to just talking to the butcher about the way the liver is going to look and using that as a little bit of a safety mechanism. But we'll see. Maybe I'll be wrong. But, you know, from my perspective as a physician, I think people need to be careful. And it's a really important discussion. And I would not recommend I'd have to be very careful about recommending, you know, raw frozen liver to people 
Um, I think that sometimes on social media now, I have to be careful of, about what I tell people I'm doing because I don't want them to think that because I do it, that they should do it. You know, sometimes I'm just experimenting. It's this in-between role between experiments that I'm doing and saying, hey, you guys should try this, right? So I sometimes don't always tell people what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, totally get that. Totally understand. And um, I think you gave a fantastic answer um, on on evidence based things. And just to just to close out the discussion, uh, hopefully people know this, but pork and chicken. Um, oh, yes. You just shouldn't be eating raw. <laughs> you should definitely not be eating pork and chicken raw. So there, there really are not um, tapeworms. Uh, very rarely are there tapeworms in beef, but there certainly are tapeworms in pork. And chicken has a lot of salmonella and campylobacter contamination. And those animals are raised completely differently than ruminants, right? Cows are on a field. Chickens are eating grain and they're, they're raised differently. And pigs are just, you know, wallowing around. They're kind of dirty. So it's just like also bear. You kind of just have to know, like it would be a very bad idea to eat raw bear meat. You will probably get a tapeworm. Um, it would be a very bad idea to eat, you know, wild animal meat raw. You don't want to eat wild game raw unless you're very careful and this kind of gets back to the lost knowledge of humans. Like as you're butchering that animal, you should be able to know what healthy and sick animal flesh looks like. And if you don't know that, you should not be eating that animal raw in any way, shape or form. And as a rule, I would agree with you completely. Pork, chicken, bear, never eat that stuff raw. So it's like this knowledge. Like if we're going to do that, we, it's our responsibility to know how it's safe. The other thing that people don't know is that salmon – Pacific salmon, I think some astronomically large number, like 80% of Pacific salmon has a tapeworm called Diphilobothrum latum. And that tapeworm causes a B12 deficiency. So if people are out fishing at the coast and they hook a salmon, they should not eat that raw. That is a dangerous, dangerous thing to eat raw. There are tapeworms in raw salmon. And people are saying, wait a minute, I eat raw salmon in my sashimi. And if you're going to do that, this, the sushi bars cannot legally serve that unless it's been frozen to kill the parasites, which is kind of where we get the idea that like freezing can kill parasites. But all the salmon that people are eating in sushi bars, that's sashimi, is probably farm raised, first of all, you need to be careful. But if it's wild salmon, it's frozen, it's never fresh. So if someone goes to the store and they get like fresh king salmon, you probably don't wanna eat that raw. Um, it's a little bit dangerous. Or you need, if you're gonna eat it raw, you need to know what that worm looks like as you cut into it. And people are gonna be like, oh, it's gross. So a little tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. And just a PSA for folks. I've been carnivore for about two and a half years now. Um, and I've gotten bad food, food poisoning twice. Um, one was from cooking chicken livers. Um, and I think I flash fried them in a pan and undercooked them. Um, so that was pretty stupid. And then the second time, I actually don't know what it was. But at the time, I was eating a lot of kind of like rare or medium rare burgers. So could have been that. Um, but hamburger is, know. hamburger is dangerous. You know, a hamburger, you know, a rare, medium rare hamburger that's going to have a lot more surface area exposed. Yeah, totally. And, um, moving on to a separate topic, everyone's favorite fat to protein ratios. Yeah, um, yeah. and this has been, this has been interesting lately. Um, I just had a guest. On, and by the time this airs, it'll have been released. Josh Blackburn, um, great guy, logical links on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and he's been writing a lot and um, talking with Amber O'Hearn and Ash Simmons and other long-term carnivores on how um, just strictly increasing the protein ratio um, of the food you're eating when you're on a carnivorous diet and you don't have any carbohydrates – um, and you're already relatively high protein, um, can be a problem. And just to contextualize this for folks, you know, a lot of the research on protein leverage is looking at taking people from 10, maybe 15% of calories from protein to 20, maybe 30% and showing great improvements in body composition, health markers, satiety, etc. But it's a kind of a different story when you're on a carnivore diet and you're saying, you know, should we be 30% protein or 50% protein? 
protein. Like just a totally different universe. And when you're trying to get all of your energy from fat and gluconeogenesis via the protein, um, there are arguments to be made about how being like super high protein and low fat could be a problem. So just wanted to, I know you've been experimenting with this a little, Paul, and poking around. So curious to hear kind of your latest views on this and, and um, what, what you might pose to folks to think about. Yeah, I think this is a really important thing. Um, from the beginning, I've kind of thought like a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to protein in terms of grams would be a reasonable starting point, which would give you about a 2.1 or 2.2 to 1 in terms of, um, you know, uh, fat to protein in terms of calories because of the caloric densities of fat and protein, relatively speaking. And even recently, I've been pushing it more towards higher fat. Josh is a good friend of mine. I've talked to him a lot about this. And I, I I really worry about high protein carnivore diets. I guess I should use my words carefully. I have some reservations about super high protein carnivore diets. There is such a thing as rabbit starvation. So we know that if we push the protein too high, at some point our biochemistry will break. And the question becomes, what point is too high and what point does does the high protein begin to be stressful for the body? And I think that the, the idea with high protein or with protein in our diets, as you correctly and you know clearly point out there, is that an increasing your protein is going to be beneficial when you're increasing it from 10 or 15 percent of your calories to 20 or 30 percent of your calories. I'm not totally convinced that there are benefits to protein beyond 30, 25 to 30 percent of our calories in a day. And I continue to have some reservations and concerns that beyond 25 to 30 percent of our caloric, uh, you know, amount coming from protein could potentially be harmful to humans. Now, if you think about it, it depends kind of what you're eating and how the steaks you're eating are. You know, I talked to Sean Baker a lot about this and he eats a lot of steaks from Costco that are pretty fatty. And so he's he thinks that he's getting about 30 to 35 percent of his calories from from uh, from protein, I think maybe even, you know, 75, probably 70, 30 from Sean's case, which I think is, is reasonable. But if people are eating, uh, mostly, um, you know, grass fed meat, which I'm a bigger fan of, and we can talk about that too, because uh, I know you may have some opinions about grass fed versus grain fed meat, but I think grass fed meat has benefits. And I talked about that a little bit in my podcast with Anthony J and the idea that grain fed cows are going to get more atrazine and have more uh, the estrogens potentially. So anyway, if you're, if people are eating grain, grass fed meat, that's going to be much leaner than grain fed meat. And they're going to easily push that protein ratio much beyond 30% unless they're very cognizant of, um, of how, how they're getting the fat and where they're getting the fat. And so this is an interesting thing. You know, I posted about it on my Facebook the other day and just, or not my Facebook, my Instagram and kind of surveyed people and said, Hey, what have you guys experienced in terms of weight loss? with these varying ratios. And I was surprised to see that people were all over the map. You know, Chris Bell said, Oh, when I cut the fat down, I felt much better. Danny Vega agreed lower fat. Um, I think even Cassie agreed lower fat. And so it, it seems that some people do okay with the higher protein, but then other people were saying no, or they weren't disagreeing. They were just saying, Hey, higher fat felt better for me. I know Josh has felt much better on higher fat. My personal sense at this point is that a higher fat ratio is more ancestrally consistent. And that may be a controversial thing to say, but that's just my opinion. That if you look at the way that the hunter-gatherers were eating, or mostly hunters, if we're thinking about it properly, were eating, I think they were eating mostly fatty meat. And I agree with Miki Bendor. I think that humans are fat hunters first and foremost. And I think that what we need to think about is getting enough fat. And then the question becomes, what is the bottom end for protein in terms of muscle building and muscle maintenance. And that's an interesting thing to think about because we know we can go too high on protein and get rabbit starvation. And we know we can go too low and lose uh, muscle mass, lose bone density. So I think it's interesting to think about what that range is and what the bottom end is as well. What I generally recommend to people now as a starting point is about 0.8 to 0.9 grams of protein, maybe one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight per day. So I'm 170 pounds. I'm maybe 8% body fat, 7% body fat. So for somebody like me, I think that in order to maintain my muscle mass, and this has been my experience, I probably don't need, you know, much more than 140 or 150 grams of protein a day. And I'm easily going to get that 
at, at a, a pound and a half of meat a day. And with the liver that I'm eating, that's going to have protein as well. So to get 140, 150 grams of protein a day is not difficult on a carnivore diet. I have had times in my life, in the carnivore life, where I was eating three plus pounds of meat a day. And I don't, I don't think I needed that. You know, I don't, I think I actually probably feel a little better personally when I'm doing less protein and, and more of the fat. And so I've even kind of experimented down in like the 130 range of protein and I feel fine and my muscle mass seems to be the same level. And I think having more of the fat is beneficial. This gets into the stuff that paleo medicine has talked about. And I think this is kind of an intriguing concept. Um, the PKD ratios. Now their ratios would be even higher. They would suggest two to one fat to protein in grams. And so they're looking at like 85 to 15, 85% of your calories from protein and 15% of your calorie, excuse me, 85% of your calories from fat, 15% of your calories from protein. So they're going pretty low protein. I think at some level, you're going to start to see your muscles drop off. And so a bottom level on protein, you know, I don't think anybody really knows. Maybe one gram or 1.1 or 1.2 grams per kilogram might be the bottom end. I wouldn't go much below that. And again, we're mixing kilograms and pounds here. People need to realize that. So, um, but I think that there is a level at which you can eat too little protein and start to see muscle loss. So there is a sweet spot in there. And I think that the fat to protein ratio is something that everybody's going to have to think about. Now, the other sort of piece of this that I will suggest to people is that perhaps ketones are valuable in this equation or perhaps things like fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C or fructosamine are valuable. What we see, and this is a question, this is something we don't know, again, we're all astronauts here, is that if you look at survival, you really want your fasting glucose to be around 85, 70 to 85. We don't really want it to be much above 90. And so I think that we can start to play with fat to protein ratios and see how that affects our fasting glucose. And again, we don't know. You know, I was having a conversation with Dave Feldman. He and I have geeky, amazing conversations all the time. And we think, oh, we should record this. And we were trying to decide whether we thought, you know, a fasting glucose of 99 or 102 in a carnivore was a big deal. And I thought, you know, I'm just not sure. Like, I've seen it and we don't know. We won't have the data for 20 years if we do a study. But I, I do think that what people will notice is if, if they do think about fat to protein ratios, they can probably pretty easily leverage that down a little bit. And I would say the goal for fasting glucose is probably around 90 or below. Um, and that's what you'll see is that when you do higher fat and lower protein, that will move almost directly correlated. You know, um, I, in, in when I've done it in myself and when I've experimented on it with clients and had friends, you know, increase the amount of fat and decrease the amount of protein, that's what we see. That glucose number slides down a little bit. And so it's just my suspicion that a fasting glucose of 98, 95 even, maybe just a little bit too high for carnivores, maybe suggesting it's a little too much protein. But that's just one metric, and people may debate me on that. Um, and I think it's an interesting thing to follow, though. What's your sense of that whole discussion? Yeah, it's super interesting to me. I I mean, I can see both sides of the argument. Um, you know, on one hand, you have people like Ted Naiman and William Schufelt and Chris Bell doing apparently super well with higher protein intakes and sort of leveraging fat um, per kind of the, the keto gains, protein sparing uh, hypothesis um, approach, protein leverage hypothesis approach. Um, but I can totally see where where Josh and, and Amber and others are coming from where, you know, if you're putting your body, if you're making your body have to work really metabolically hard to even if gluconeogenesis is completely demand driven, but you're basically saying, hey, I'm going to give you a lot less energy in the form of fat and I'm going to make you either have to rip the fat out of our own cells or convert a bunch of protein, either from the protein you eat or from your muscles that that's really metabolically expensive. And we want things to be metabolically expensive to some extent. That's why we exercise. That's why we do, you know, we go out in the cold. We do some of these things to make it harder on ourselves so our bodies will adapt. But if you're always eating high protein, I start to worry about um, 
some of these things taking a toll. And um, Josh has made some excellent points about how it, it can not just be bad for your energy, but um, having higher protein chronically could exacerbate some of the things that people see healing with carnivore diet. So, you know, maybe that mentally people do a lot better with higher fat and getting higher ketones. Um, maybe people have better joint responses from having higher fat and higher ketones and, and less insulin um, from the protein. Um, and I know glucagon's there to counteract it, but it's, it's just a really interesting hypothesis. And uh, I love what you say about how we're all astronauts. So yeah. still a lot to figure out. A lot to figure out. But, you know, my sense is that I definitely raise an eyebrow when I have a carnivore client or somebody comes to me who's been doing carnivore and their A1C is 5.9, 5.8, you know, or their fasting glucose is 103 or 98. It's like, yeah, I would, I would probably adjust that a little bit. And I mean, what's the concern about dropping the protein? It's loss of lean muscle mass, right? So just keep an eye on the muscle mass. If people feel like they're losing lean muscle mass, then fine, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> I just don't think it's going to happen, especially not at 0.8 grams per pound, lean pound, lean, you know, body weight, or even, you know, 0.9. I don't, I don't think we're going to lose lean muscle mass with that amount of protein. Um, the other hard think- part here is, is how do we leverage up fat? So, you know, buying a bunch of steaks will be them grain finished or grass finished and just cooking them up. Um, is easy. That's part of what makes the carnivore diet so successful. And even if you're adding in liver and stuff like that, it's still pretty easy. Um, but when you have to say, oh, now I have to make sure I'm getting enough fat, it adds this whole other element for people. Um, and I'm sure Josh would push back and say, Scott, it's actually super easy. Like, just do it like this. But, you know, it, it's, it's, for me at least, it's, it's not as easy as, just buying steaks or buying ground beef or buying eggs and cooking them up. It's, you know, how do I make sure I'm getting a lot of a fat source that's easily digestible? Because if people are just going to eat a ton, a ton of tallow or rendered fat or butter, you know, they might have digestive issues. Yeah. And I was actually talking with um, Alma, who is conscious carnivore on Instagram and she's in somewhere in Europe hopefully going to get her on my podcast at some point soon. And she and I were agreeing that I think she was saying that people were debating me about this on my Instagram the other day, but technically I think tallow can either be rendered fat or just animal fat. That is not suet. Suet is kidney fat. And um, in my conversations with Josh, she said, yeah, it's easy. Just go to the butcher and ask for suet. And I think you can also go to the butcher and ask for tallow. And so I think it's worthwhile. I think all of these things, it's, it's good to be intentional about how we're doing this. And once we sort of create the groove, we'll make it real easy for ourselves to do it. But in the beginning, it is one more thing to have to source, right? How do we source good quality animal fat? However we end up doing it, I think it's worth it. And I'm not a fan of the liquid tallow that's rendered. I think that the ideal thing and what I found to be so much better is just buying either grass fed or whatever you can find trimmings tallow that is not rendered or suet and using that. And I know Michaela is doing this now, Michaela Peterson, you just throw it in the pan and cook it briefly. Um, I don't have any concerns about eating the fat raw or you can just eat the fat completely raw. It's pretty good. Sometimes if the fat is really good, it tastes a little like cheese. Sometimes it's a little waxy, but it, it is one more thing to do. But I also think that it's good to do intentional things for our health. It's a worthwhile thing to do. So that's been my, that's been my answer is that don't do the rendered fat. Don't do the liquid fat. And we can talk about reasons that that may not be the best thing to do. I think getting the quote unquote real fat from the animal, whether it's suet or tallow that's not rendered from a butcher is a worthwhile endeavor. And I think that you have a good point here that at some point this whole thing gets to be a little complicated for people, but that's what we're doing is just sort of trying to help people understand why why they'd want to do this. And, you know, I think the more people that do it, the easier it gets and the more available these type of things get. So I do also totally respect that perspective. And this is kind of Sean's perspective that the more people that are able to do a simple carnivore diet, the more people that are going to benefit. And I think that's a great idea. That's totally true as well, which is, I think Sean's perspective that he's open to liver and open to organ meats, but it's much easier to just say to somebody, Hey, eat a bunch of steak and eggs. 
And, and I think, I think of that as like, yeah, that's great. That's a good introductory carnivore diet. Get as many people doing that as you can and see how they feel. And if they feel better, maybe help them. Maybe that's what you and I are doing is just providing the next level of education. Say, okay, now let's take it to the next level. You're feeling good. But I think there's a lot of value in that sort of message that Sean is, is putting out there. Like, Hey, you know, this is the most simple way to do it. That's really valuable. But personally, I feel like there are better iterations that can be done. I don't want that to get in the way of people trying it though. Totally. And how, just, um, to your point of, of not always recommending what you do, how, how are you doing this right now? I've been experimenting with more fat. Um, and I've been probably doing 130 to 140 grams of protein a day and the rest is fat. And I got, I found a, a specialty foods source here in Seattle. And they ordered me 44 pounds of grass-fed beef trimmings. So I split it with my friend Nathan here in Seattle. And I've got, you know, I've been eating it quickly, but I had 20 pounds of grass-fed trimmings in my in my fridge and freezer for a little while. And that's what I've been doing. And that obviously it's not the only thing I've been doing. I've been doing liver as well and really thinking about salt a lot recently. But yeah, that's what I've been doing for fat to protein, kind of pushing that up higher. And I mean, I would estimate, I, I'm not one of these guys that likes to count, but I think for reproducibility, it's probably helpful for people. My estimate is that I'm getting, oh, at least 200 grams of fat a day now. Maybe, probably more. I would say there's probably more than 200, maybe 250 grams of fat. 200 to 250 grams of fat a day and 120 to 100, 140 grams of protein a day. So, uh, maybe I'm getting close to those PKD ratios, you know, the two to one even. I don't think I'm completely there, but I'm kind of trending in that direction and, and I feel pretty good with it at this point. Awesome. Well, uh, curious to track your progress on that. And I'm sure folks, folks will hear more from you on your Instagram and your podcasts. Um, if they want to follow up to see how that kind of experiment is going. Um, yeah, I've got more, more blood work coming next week, so it'll be interesting to look at my fasting glucose. I don't think I've been doing it long enough to fully get the effect on the hemoglobin A1C, but perhaps I'll see it on the fructosamine, but definitely I'll see it on the fasting glucose. So I'm curious to see what my fasting glucose is with less less protein and a little more, a significant amount more fat. Awesome. And you mentioned uh, salt, so would love to dive into electrolytes a bit. And you posed a really interesting hypothesis about this on on Brian Sanders' Peak Human podcast. But um, you know, on on keto, people talk about needing to supplement with salt, potassium, magnesium. Um, we've also talked about the need for for possible need for bone meal for calcium. Um, you know, why as carnivores and do we as carnivores need to be careful about all of these minerals? Um, and how should we go about that? You know, it's an interesting thing that I've been thinking more and more about. Um, there is something that happens when we are fasting and a ketosis or a ketogenic diet mimics this, the fasting state in terms of mTOR, in terms of many things, it looks like fasting to our bodies, but we get this naturesis of fasting. We get salt wasting when we're fasting, and I don't understand why, and it's not necessarily a, a good or a bad thing. It just happens. And I, you know, the more I've read about this, you know, on the Verta blog from Jeff Bolick and Steve Finney, it, it really makes a lot of sense that when people transition to carnivore or ketogenic diets, they're going to have a massive increase in the amount of salt needed because they're going to be losing a lot more salt. And I don't think people realize how much salt they're going to be needing when they make this transition, but it is it is a lot. And even in people who, so there was a study done, I can probably find it um, for you, and it looked at the, it was just an, an observational epidemiology study, but it looked at the amount of sodium and potassium excreted in the urine, and they looked at survival of people. And this is not people on ketogenic or carnivore diets. This is m totally mixed populations of people. And what they found was that people that the, the best survival was in people who were excreting around five grams of sodium in their urine. And then so there was a real steep decline uh, or a steep improvement in the survival uh, below, you know, from below five to five. So what that would suggest was that if people were excreting less than five grams of sodium, not sodium chloride, but sodium in their urine, then they were not going to survive as long. That seemed to be a very bad thing to do. 
And then uh, beyond five, the survival went down just a little bit. And so it was hard to say whether that was actually an artifact of too much sodium. Is it possible for humans to get too much sodium or was it something else those people were doing? Because again, this is observational epidemiology. The potassium thing was curve was interesting. It basically showed improvement. The more potassium you got, the better you were doing, or the more potassium you were excreting in your urine, the better you were doing in your life. And again, this is observational epidemiology, so it's hard to know what that means, but it was, at least at some level, it was clear that we needed to make sure that we had enough potassium. Now, I'll come back to the potassium discussion in a second because there's a big asterisk there. There's a big caveat for people if they want to supplement with potassium. It can be dangerous. But around sodium, I'll just say that at five grams of sodium excretion per day is about 10 to 11 grams of sodium chloride per day. Now, this is in people who are not on ketogenic or carnivore diets. I would suggest or hypothesize that if we are on a ketogenic carnivore diet, we're going to be losing more sodium than that. And I don't know how much, but you probably have to adjust that number up, which means that 10 grams of sodium, and this is probably going to depend on the average size of the person as well. I would say 10 grams of sodium chloride a day is probably the bottom end for people on carnivore and ketogenic diets. And 10 grams of sodium chloride is more, it's like more than two tables, teaspoons, excuse me, more than two teaspoons of salt. Yeah. And, you know, Redmond Sea Salt, I love these guys. They sent me these little like travel size Redmond things and I posted it out on my story. And they're, they're pretty, they're, you know, they're like the size, I don't know how big to describe it. They're like the size of, almost like the size of my pinky finger. Like they're like the width of my pinky finger and they're about as long. And, uh, you know, two of those was 12 grams of salt. So you think, wow, two of those in a day, like that's a lot of salt that I don't think a lot of people are getting that much salt. And it doesn't have to be all be on your food. You can mix it in your water. You know, I've heard James D. Antonio talk about a little bit of salt with water before you go work out to increase your blood volume. But, you know, people need to know that like it's reasonable to be eating 10 to probably 15 grams of sodium chloride a day to get enough salt. And the problem is that if we don't get enough sodium, our body will push the cortisol way up because our body's trying to keep the sodium. That's one of the mechanisms. So we'll actually, we can cause insulin resistance if we're not getting enough sodium. And not getting enough sodium is going to cause us to waste potassium because there's a sodium potassium sort of counter exchanger in the kidney. When we absorb sodium, we get rid of potassium. And so we're going to have to waste potassium to hold on to the sodium. And it's hard to know which one the body's going to favor. I think we have so much more sodium in our blood than potassium. You know, if you look at the concentrations of sodium and potassium in the blood, potassium is around 3.5 to 4, and sodium is around 135 or 140. So sodium is clearly very important. Our bodies are going to hold that level of sodium in the blood very constant. It's going to do that at almost any cost. It's going to give us insulin resistance in order to hold on to sodium. So low sodium diets are a very big problem. So my sense is that when people go keto or carnivore and they get fatigued or they get electrolyte abnormalities or they see their hormones tank, it's probably because they're not getting enough salt. Or one really plausible explanation is they're not getting enough salt, they're not, and then their cortisol is going way up in order to, um, in order to save that. And then they have to push up the aldosterone as well in order to, to save the, uh, to save the sodium. So giving yourself enough sodium is a really important thing. When I posted about this on a recent Instagram live, people said, well, did our ancestors get that much? And it's, you know, I think this is an interesting conversation. I think that our ancestors probably had access to blood, which is very high in sodium or higher in sodium. And fresher meat would have had more blood in it and been saltier than uh, the meat that we get now. And then there were things like salt licks. And I think our ancestors probably did realize that salt was a good thing. And they probably would have had access to salty rocks. So I think, yeah, our ancestors didn't have salt shakers, but they probably had access to the salt licks. I mean, these are naturally occurring in the environment. So I think we would have had these. Um, and I think that's a really important point. Now, if you talk to most people doing carnivore or keto, they will tell you about um, cramping and, you know, uh, Charlie horses. It seems to be related to other electrolytes. For some people, it's potassium. For some people, it's magnesium. And it, I'm not entirely sure why we're not getting enough of these on carnivore diets or why we're wasting them. Perhaps it's because we're not getting enough salt and Sodium is causing us to waste magnesium or waste potassium. But regardless, I think it's pretty darn safe to supplement with magnesium and potassium, although I'll talk about the potassium. And the magnesium supplementation really does seem to help a lot of people in terms of transition into carnivore and in terms of cramping. 
uh, muscle cramps. So I think it's reasonable to supplement magnesium. You know, I was talking a little bit to Rob Wolf at Paleo FX and his thought was, yeah, maybe the magnesium, and this goes back a little bit to the spring water, that if you're actually drinking spring water or mineral water, that has much more magnesium in it than tap water. So perhaps we were getting the minerals from bathing and or drinking natural sources of water all the time. And again, the blood is going to have some magnesium in it as well. So just question, you know, where do we, our ancestors get it? I think that there were multiple sources and we're sort of removed from that. So discussing the potassium, the idea here is that, you know, if you look at supplements of potassium on the shelf in the grocery store, they can't go above 99 milligrams per pill. It's like a legal thing because taking too much oral potassium can cause arrhythmias. And if people want to supplement with potassium, 99 milligrams of potassium is not usually going to do it, but you have to work with your physician on this. You have to know what your baseline potassium is, and you have to make sure you're not taking drugs like ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, other diuretics that are going to cause your electrolytes to be funky. So people should be very careful about supplementing with potassium. And when my clients say, hey, should I take potassium? I say, only when we've checked your serum potassium and we know what it's doing, because I've got a bag of potassium chloride on my counter across from me right now. And if I were just to go over there and take a couple of spoonfuls of that, I could put myself in a big way. I probably would get sick, nauseous, and throw up before I get an arrhythmia. But it's possible to ingest enough potassium chloride to make yourself pretty sick. And if enough of that gets into your serum, you could create an arrhythmia um, in, a, in a dangerous way. So potassium, you have to be a little careful of, but people do benefit from it. So it's probably safe, but just be aware and know where your baseline potassium level is. Then we talked about calcium. Critical, critical. I mean, you know, people in the carnivore community have kind of pushed back toward me on this and said, we don't need calcium. Our serum calcium looks fine. I think you don't understand human physiology. We have you know, hundreds of grams of calcium stored in your bones, but you don't want to have to be pulling the calcium out of the bones to maintain the serum levels of calcium. You want to be getting calcium every day. And if we look at animals, which are not always the best proxy for humans, but I think in this case, the physiology is equivalent or extremely congruent, we probably should be balancing calcium and phosphorus every day in our diet. And meat is very high in phosphorus. And if you eat you know, a pound of meat is going to have, I think, around I'll, around a thousand milligrams of phosphorus in a pound of meat. Well, where are you getting a thousand milligrams of potassium, or excuse me, of calcium from in your diet if you're not eating an eggshell or bone meal? You know, some people do dairy. Again, I've had mixed feelings about dairy for a variety of reasons. But where are we getting the calcium from to balance that phosphorus? If we look at zoo animals, if we look at other carnivores, lions in the zoo, we know they get osteodystrophy if they're not fed calcium, if that calcium phosphorus ratio is off. I think a few months ago I posted a paper, you know, from the 1950s or 1960s saying, yeah, humans probably need about a one to one or even 1.5 to one ratio of calcium to phosphorus in the diet. Sean kind of countered with an article and said, hey, when we're on a high protein diet, we can increase the amount of calcium absorption from our foods. And I said, yeah, that's fine, but there's not a lot of calcium in a steak. I mean, there is a small amount, but there's a very small amount, and there's a little bit of calcium in egg yolks. And so the way I did the calculation, I think one egg yolk has, I forget, 10 or 15 milligrams of calcium, and I think a pound of steak might have 25 milligrams of calcium. So we're looking at minuscule amounts it's of like calcium. Nothing. What's that? It's yeah, like and if you, even if you triple those, you're still going to fall very far short of a one-to-one -one ratio of calcium to phosphorus. And so, you know, I love the testing aspect of this. So I always say to people like, hey, if you have questions, just test this. This is not a question, you know, like if you have a question, test your, you know, test your N-telopeptide, which is a measure of bone resorption, and test your PTH, which is parathyroid hormone. And your N-telopeptide should be very low and your parathyroid hormone should be in the bottom quartile, the bottom fourth of normal. If I see someone, I do PTH, probably uh, parathyroid hormone levels, which is the hormone in these small glands that are embedded in the thyroid that modulates calcium for humans. I do this on all my clients now. And if I see their PTH above maybe 20 or 25, I think, yeah, your, your body is working to pull calcium out of the bones. I don't like this. And I'll check an N-telopeptide. 
I just want to make sure they're getting enough calcium. A serum calcium is not a good measure of calcium intake. And, you know, I try to tell people, like, look at how much phosphorus you're getting in your diet. I mean, a crude measure is a pound of meat is about a gram of phosphorus. And, hey, for every pound of meat, I think you want to have about a gram of calcium in your diet. The flip side of this discussion is people get worried because there was a series of studies from the 1990s and early 2000s that showed that women, potentially men as well, taking calcium supplements had increased levels of coronary artery atherosclerosis. But I think that that is an indication of systemic vitamin K2 deficiency. And it argues, I tell my clients like, hey, you don't need to worry about taking calcium as long as you're getting your fat soluble vitamins, which is more of an argument to eat things like liver for vitamin A, getting out in the sun enough for vitamin D. Vitamin K2 is sort of abundant on a carnivore diet, especially if we're eating animals that are grass fed. Muscle meat has a decent amount of K2. Liver has K2. Egg yolks have K2. Um, we're going to get enough of the fat soluble vitamins that we need to move calcium around the body in the right way. I don't worry at all about calcium supplementation when we have the fat soluble vitamins. On a standard American diet, yeah, probably not a good idea to be megadosing with vitamin D and vitamin uh, and calcium because everyone is vitamin K2 deficient. So that's the idea with calcium. Yeah. And then we can talk about bicarbonate a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. So bicarbonate is, you know, it kind of goes back to this idea of urinary pH. And I thought about this more. I talked about it on Peak Human. If you look at spring water, there's bicarbonate in spring water. You know, I was out at the coast this weekend surfing. You look at a Gerald Steiner bottle, there's a hundred, there's a thousand 800 milligrams of bicarbonate in a liter of Gerald Steiner. So we're clearly getting bicarbonate from mineral waters and from spring waters. And so if people are not drinking mineral or water and spring water, we might need to think about where we're getting bicarbonate from. This is just this ancestral perspective, you know? Um, and, you know, I don't know that urinary pH is the best thing to check. I do have some of my clients kind of tracking urinary pH, but the more I look into urinary pH, I think it's probably acidic and carnivores because they're in ketosis and beta hydroxybutyric acid is in their urine. And so it kind of burns me when these people in the keto space talk about alkaline keto and they'll say, oh, you need your urine to be alkaline on keto. That's kind of hogwash, you know, because I think the only way to get an alkaline urine on a ketogenic diet is to kick yourself out of ketosis, you know, by eating enough vegetables to stop the ketones. So I think that this idea of looking at urinary pH for alkaline keto is kind of malarkey. And, but I do think that it's important to think about where we're getting our water from. And if we're drinking water from the tap, you know, you might want to know like, well, how much bicarbonate is in this water? And maybe I should get just a little bit of bicarbonate per day, which people can do by using baking soda during like periods of not eating. You don't want to do baking soda or eggshells around meals because it could change the pH of your stomach in a, in a negative way. So that, that gets a pretty granular. Uh, there and you know hopefully that won't be too much for people but i i think that you know this podcast is pretty pretty highbrow carnivore so hopefully people will find value in that discussion yeah super interesting and and love all the points you made around um electrolytes and definitely makes sense how we would need to supplement and i appreciate it in your in the first edition of your newsletter how you talked about um you, you link to a study showing people um not getting enough salt on a ketogenic diet can be, be a huge problem um, yeah. for fatigue. Um, so very interesting. Yeah. And then Paul, an, another thing I wanted to ask you about, and it's a little bit of a niche topic, but something that kind of, um, is very relevant to people trying carnivore, uh, especially because a lot of people come to carnivore with digestive issues. Um, and a lot of them with SIBO and there is one form of SIBO called hydrogen sulfide based SIBO. I'm not sure how familiar with it you are. Um, but it's postulated, um, particularly by Dr. Michael Ruscio, um, and others have talked about this, how it may be exacerbated by, um, by meat and eggs, particularly. Um, so this is like the ultimate nightmare of a carnivore. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Ahead. Yeah. I sort of disagree with that conceptualization of hydrogen sulfide SIBO. I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you going to say anything else? No, about no, it? no. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So when we think about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we generally think about hydrogen or methane predominant SIBO. And those are from hydrogen or methanogen producing bacteria in the gut. But there is this specter of hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Now, 
this is clearly not well understood. And I, I would really characterize it as a ghost. I don't think we know about hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Mark Pimentel at Cedar sinai is doing some trials with hydrogen sulfide SIBO. I'm not convinced it's a real thing. Um, and I'm not invalidating people who have been told they have hydrogen sulfide SIBO. I'm just saying I'm not convinced that it's actually an overgrowth of uh, sulfur-producing bacteria in the gut. The two that people talk about are biophilia wadsworthia and one called desful, des, desulfovibrio or desulfvibrio. And the thing is that if you look at the literature around sulfur in the gut, we know that we need some hydrogen sulfide in the gut, but too much seems to be a problem. And it's like, well, okay. But then if you look at the way people are treating SIBO, that's from hydrogen or methanogen producing bacteria, they're using low fermentable starch foods. And that's why a carnivore diet is probably very helpful because it helps the gut heal by not putting fiber into the small intestine. And I've spoken about this before on other podcasts. My suspicion is that SIBO gets caused from an autoimmune issue in the first place, that it's that it's dysmotility related to autoimmune attack on the myenteric plexus in the gut. Now, the problem here is that low FODMAP diets, and in this case, I think Ruscio would argue that a carnivore diet, being a low FODMAP diet, would not work for hydrogen sulfide SIBO. And you think, well, I don't, I don't really believe that we understand what we're dealing with here. My sense of people who are having intolerance to sulfur foods is that they probably have a molybdenum deficiency. And we've seen this, you know, I think people are sulfur sensitive, but I think that the glaring thing to think about is molybdenum deficiency because the enzyme sulfate oxidase or SUOX is molybdenum dependent. And if we look at plant foods, they're generally pretty poor in molybdenum because they're grown in molybdenum poor soils. Um, if you look at animal sources of molybdenum, the really big one is liver, which I think is a very strong argument to eat nose to tail. And this is just another example of why I have concerns with people eating only muscle meat. You know, there's copper, molybdenum. Those are big things that our bodies need, and they're really only found any particular amount in the liver, um, about 10 plus times higher concentrations than in muscle meat. So I think that the first thing to do if people feel like they're sulfur sensitive, yeah, you might want to cut out the egg white. I don't think there's a lot of sulfur in the egg yolk. Um, but you could cut out egg whites, and then I would consider liver for molybdenum. You don't want to over-supplement with molybdenum because like many of the metals, not all the metals, but like many of the metals, molybdenum can have, be, cause oxidative stress in excess. So you'd be pretty, you got to be careful how much molybdenum you take in a day, but you could supplement with molybdenum under the guidance of a functional medicine doc, or you could start eating a reasonable amount of liver to get molybdenum. And that would be my recommendation for people who have sulfur sensitivity. The thing about hydrogen sulfide SIBO is we actually don't have a test for it. It's like a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, if the people have symptoms and they see this hydrogen and methane are both low on a breath test, it's like, well, at this point, again, it's like we're guessing, you know, we're guessing. And I'm not convinced that we have enough evidence to really say that that's what's going on. Usually what happens is people have sort of continued gut symptoms on um, when they're eating food and it looks like SIBO clinically, but they have low uh, hydrogen and methane. Well, to me, that's like, what if they're just having, that could be a million things. That could be oxalates, that could be lectins, that could be, you know, a food allergy. It could be many things related to plant foods. I would love to see someone who's been diagnosed with hydrogen sulfide SIBO go to a carnivore diet and see what they do. We just don't have enough data about this right now. I mean, theoretically, if you put sulfur-containing foods into sulfur-containing overgrowth, maybe you're going to have a problem, but I, I, I just i am not convinced by the theory, and I think that the first thing to do would be molybdenum. It's hard to test your molybdenum levels, but think about that. Think about how well your SUOX enzyme is working, and there are SNPs in the SUOX enzyme that you can test for on 23andMe, things like that, but People find they're sulfur sensitive. I'd say maybe you should eat more liver as a start. And then we need to really understand what we're doing in the gut here. I think this is a lot of guesswork at this point. 
Have you seen people or encounter people who have been diagnosed with hydrogen sulfide SIBO and they're not doing well on carnivore? Because I've never seen it. No, I, it's more, um, it, and I think you make some great points. I think in general, GI conditions, it seems like a lot of diagnoses there are a guessing game. Like it's very yeah. hard to distinguish one from the other, you know, SIBO from IBS from, you know, a lot of times it, fe- it feels like I, he- I read stories of people just their doctors kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, but this one in particular caught my attention because uh, I have heard of people on carnivore still having digestive issues. Um, that is not uncommon. And, I can talk about that. And yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear you talk about that. But um, so, so someone posed the question to me the other day, you know, could it be this? Um, and I think it was after listening to Dr. Ruscio talk about it. Right. So I think that when people on carnivore still have digestive issues, this is when you need a nucleic acid amplification test of the stool. Uh, this is when you need something like a GI map. So I have a number of carnivores that I work with who have had GI map panels on carnivore and they still have things like Clostridium difficile or H. pylori or blastocystis or Entamoeba histolytica. I think carnivore diet is going to get rid of SIBO. I think it's going to be very helpful for hydrogen or methane SIBO. I'm not convinced that going carnivore is going to get rid of very bad bugs in the gut, you know? And sometimes this is what you need to do is you need to go in there and say, okay, you know, we don't fully understand the gut. We don't fully understand how to create the ecosystem in the gut. But I do think that there are people on carnivore diets who need to have this specialty testing of their gut and then go in there and just eradicate those organisms. Um, I've seen it, you know, time and time again that people have inflammation in their gut, um, even on carnivore, and it's usually because there's a bad pathogenic organism that's still hanging out there. And the meat isn't going to, like, kill it. It's not going to necessarily feed any other bad bugs. I think that the... A carnivore diet can be very helpful for some conditions of bacterial overgrowth, but I don't know that a carnivore diet is going to, is going to actually correct, um, real infections in the gut, you know, C. diff, H. pylori, you know, blastocystis, entamoeba histolytica, other parasites, bad things. I don't think it's going to get rid of that. Yeah, that's really interesting and, and totally makes sense. Um, that some of these these conditions would require more testing and perhaps uh, more advanced interventions um, yeah. to get rid of some of the underlying conditions there. Um, yeah. Well, Paul, this has been incredibly interesting for me, very helpful, and glad that, you know, not surprised, but glad that you were able to dive so deep on some of these more niche topics. Um, where can folks find out more about you? We mentioned a lot of it in the upfront, but I'll also link to this stuff in the show notes and uh, what can they get excited about coming from you soon? Oh, so I've got, like I said, I've got the newsletter happening. They can go to my website, Paul Saladino MD front slash newsletter, or just my website, Paul Saladino MD.com and find the link to the newsletter. Check out my podcast. I'm interviewing some cool people coming up next week. I've got, or depending when this comes out, I got Paul Mason coming up and, uh, I'm going to interview Cassie Wild tonight from the carnivore community. I'm going to do Peter Ballerstad this weekend. And then in the summer, I'm going to get Dom D'Agostino on there. And so those are the main things I've got. People probably know where I am on Insta, but I'm Paul Saladino MD. On Twitter, I'm MD Saladino. I'm on Facebook at Paul Saladino MD. And I've got a YouTube channel at Paul Saladino MD. But in the future for me, you've got the, I've got the move to San Diego. If people are in San Diego and they want to see me in person, they can reach out to me. My email is on the website. And I'm writing a book, man. It's coming together. Every week it gets closer. Awesome. I think I'm still, still a few months away. Um, I got a new title for the book, though. I'll, 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 uh, you want to hear the title? I haven't told anybody the title. Oh, yeah, the title. let's hear it. Is it Dr. Radical? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Radical's Guide to Being Amazing. <laughs> no, on my, on my Instagram, I posted uh, a copy of like Apex Predator. But the more I thought about it, I was, okay, I think I'm going to change the title. So the, the title now, I think the title I'm going to go with is The Carnivore Code, Secrets to Optimal Health um, Through or By Returning to Our Ancestral Diet. So something like that is probably what it's going to be. I'll, I'll tell people the actual 
have a, a mock up of the title, but I can't remember the actual way we were going to word it. I'll find it for you on one sec, but yeah, it's, it's going to be super exciting. Um, so basically, um, oh shoot, I put something on Instagram. I gave it to Brandon on Instagram because he's helping me, um, with visuals. So, oh, okay. So the carnivore code unlocking the secrets to optimal health by returning to our ancestral diet. I love it. So that's, that's the book, man. I think that's going to be it. It's coming out probably three or four months. So give it time, but, uh, it's getting closer and I think it's, it's going to be amazing. It's, it's really been a labor of love so far. Every chapter I get to dig into stuff really deeply and I think people are really going to dig it. It's just like going to be my version of, um, you know, the full, the full jam, you know, the full sort of, connection of um how to create you know how to intellectually think about why we should eat carnivore why plants are not a great idea from you know kind of like this full thesis it'll be like my dissertation in a way awesome i can't wait to get that and give it to others too um, yeah that'll thanks, be man. that'll be super great um well thanks again for your time today paul really appreciate it and hope you have a great great one thanks scott i'll talk to you soon man yep later later If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.